Here at Octorock Rock Reviews, we're well known for our no-nonsense approach to criticizing your favorite games and getting you to regret ever subscribing to the channel in the first place. But today, we're gonna put that on hold in lieu of reviewing an actual piece of physical media that may or may not just so happen to house the very games that I've reviewed on this channel so far. Okay, so to catch you all up to speed, last February was the 35th anniversary of the Legend of Zelda series, and the game Nintendo decided to re-release in order to celebrate that anniversary was... God, da, not the Zelda series' finest piece of work. Fans like me weren't happy, to say the least, and by fans like me, I mean the old farts who still played the first Zelda and didn't think Breath of the Wild was the hot shit everyone else said it was. But that announcement wasn't for fans like me, as I previously theorized in my Zelda 1 review. It was for the newcomers, the roughly 16 million new fans that were drawn in by Breath of the Wild, a game that tripled the sales of even the most successful Zelda game that preceded it. It turns out, however, that Nintendo did have something planned for the old men like myself, and that plan was to put the series' oldest games on the company's oldest line of electronic products. When I first saw the Zelda Game & Watch, I'll admit, I was pretty giddy about it. Not because I'm a fan of the Game & Watch, mind you, I've never actually owned one until now, but because of the lineup of games preloaded onto this sucker. The Zelda Game & Watch has Zelda 1, Zelda 2, and Link's Awakening, the series' only Game Boy title all ready to play on this tiny little emulator, while still fitting in a cinematic clock, an interactive timer that doubles as an added horde mode for Zelda 2, which is something I never thought I'd see, and a traditional Game & Watch title featuring a brand new coat of Zelda paint. In other words, this thing is fucking stacked with features and games, and considering that all of that was being fit into the classic Game & Watch shell, it seemed like a good deal to me at the time when I pre-ordered it. So, did it live up to the hype? Should you buy Little Johnny a Zelda Game & Watch for Christmas this year? <laughs> Probably not. Before we get down to brass tacks, let's take a quick look at what you're actually getting here when you open the package. Most unboxing videos are rough, barbaric, but here at Octorock Reviews, we treat all our games with only the most surgical level of care. The first sort of weird thing that you'll notice with the actual product when you compare it to all the promotional media is that part of the box art, specifically the Zelda 1 assets, aren't on the cardboard itself, but in the plastic case that it comes in. This isn't actually a problem, it just looks really weird, like it's a printing error or something. The next thing of note is the little case the Game & Watch comes in, specifically the fact that it's a flimsy piece of shit and I have no idea why it was included. This time, the misleading promotional material is a little more dubious, since the box they show in the commercials looks pretty alright without the terrible looking white edges on the actual product, nor with the glossy finish that catches fingerprints like the Black Plague. I also really like the fact that they purposefully didn't show the backside with the kickstand in any of these ads because it only gets worse. I refuse to pop mine out because I'd rather just keep this stuff all together in the box. I mean, for a real collector's item like this, I don't even know why you'd display it outside of the box in the first place, but hey, for all two of you who feel like displaying your game and watch on a flimsy piece of cardboard, eh, go ahead. Then comes the actual product itself. For the most part, this thing is actually pretty good, but let's start with a few complaints I have just to get them out of the way. One, if you ever held a Game & Watch before, then you know the build quality is pretty damn good on these things, and for this model, the buttons and metal plate match that quality pretty well. The plastic shell, on the other hand, does not. It isn't terrible, and it'll last so long as you don't abuse it, but there's a clear dip in quality from the originals. They had a harder, thicker shell that used six screws instead of four. The other nitpick here is the charger the system comes with. This thing is a comedic joke. I don't know how Nintendo expects anyone to play this thing while it's charging, but you won't, that's for sure. For reference, here's the Game Boy Advance. As you can see, nice and long. And here's what the... <sighs> Hold on a second. There we go. Here's the Game & Watch charger. It's a fucking joke. But that's where most of my complaints end, because other than these all relatively minor faults, this thing is an absolute jam. For me, at least. Modern controllers have been notorious with their awful D-pads, but the Game & Watch is a 40-year-old piece of hardware that literally invented the D-pad, so it's an absolute joy to use. 
As I'll reference several times going forward, I played Link's Awakening on my Game Boy Advance just to compare the experience, and I honestly think the Game & Watch outclasses even that system's D-pad, which is my personal favorite to use when it comes to the handheld consoles. I tested it extensively for bad inputs, but I couldn't get it to register any, and that combined with the wonderful action buttons makes the system feel like an old school handheld, which is exactly what it's trying to replicate. The quality of the screen is probably the thing that shocked me the most. You can't really tell with this secondhand footage, but the colors are very well defined, the screen is backlit, and I'd be really surprised if the image was anything less than 720p. For such a tiny screen, I couldn't have expected any better, and that's what I'd say is the best thing about the hardware itself, quality-wise. On the software side of things, the emulation is quite good, or at least as good as you would expect from a Game & Watch. The software allows you to reset any of the games, and never actually exits it even when you switch to another app abruptly. Not only do you have the NTSC ports available, but the Japanese originals are on the system too, which is actually a bigger deal than that sounds. The music is entirely different, since the Famicom Disk system that Zelda 1 and 2 debuted on had a more advanced sound chip than the NES. So you basically get two versions of the game's soundtrack to listen to while beating these first two titles, which is a neat touch. For some reason, the German and French ports of Link's Awakening are on the console as well, and all of these different language versions are, I assume, on their own ROM, since the save data for each version is completely separate. That means there's a total of four NES and four Game Boy ROMs downloaded all onto this tiny little thing, so the software hidden on this little device is more substantial than you'd first expect. Besides that, I mentioned a Zelda 2 Horde mode being added, and yeah, for all 20-something of you who really liked Zelda 2, this is the device for you, cause this is probably the only new Zelda 2 related content you'll ever get. It's okay, but funny enough, they must have built this from the ground up, because they actually fixed some bugs that existed in the original. Dark Link can't be cheesed with the stand in the corner glitch anymore, and you can't fight Dark Nuts by jumping up and stabbing at them like in the original, which leads me to conclude that this was a glitch and not a feature. So now you're forced to do these fights in their intended mode of gameplay. This only enforces how much I hate the original. All that sounds nice, right? Well, here's the catch. Most of the games are almost unplayable due to the tiny screen. Yep, you heard that right. What's the problem here? Well, it's a problem that the Nintendo Switch has been facing for many years now, so let's switch gears and look at what the problem is with the Switch. You see, when you develop a game, you either make it for home consoles or handhelds. One issue that the Switch has had is that it's both, so by default, most devs opt to develop the game for home consoles. Have you ever played a game in handheld mode on the Switch, then suddenly thought, I can't read the text here. It's because the proportions are meant to be seen on a television screen, not a 6-inch tablet. Hell, it's why YouTube, the site you're watching this video on, has mobile and desktop versions of their same website. You ever try navigating YouTube on a phone using the desktop site? It's fucking horrible, you can't read a damn thing, and good luck tapping on the right part of the screen. When you're designing an app, or a website, or a game, screen size is an important thing to account for. And guess what? Playing these home console NES releases on this tiny little screen that's smaller than the fucking Game Boy Advance is not fun at all. This kind of completely kills the whole experience of playing these games on this device, and I cannot recommend that anyone play these games on this thing. It's just an abysmal experience, especially for those of you with less than perfect eyesight. So why did I say earlier that the Zelda Game & Watch was a total jam to play? Two words. Link's Awakening. For real, this game is the only reason this thing isn't a complete disappointment to me. Unlike the other two games on here, Link's Awakening was developed for the Game Boy, an LCD piece of shit that, for my younger viewers, had a screen comparable to that of a cheap calculator. So comparatively, the Game & Watch screen I placed earlier is a godsend for this game. Its proportions were built for tiny screens like the Game & Watches, and the backlit, crisp HD screen on this thing makes playing Link's Awakening a total jam on this device. 
If we compare the Game Boy version to the Game & Watch, we can already see where the issues lie for the Game Boy. The Advance has a backlit screen and comfortable buttons, sure, but the cartridge sticks out like an extended mag. Also, the shoulder buttons change the resolution, and for any of you who've played Fire Red on the Advance will know quite well, these things are very easy to accidentally bump your finger into during normal play, which is a huge pet peeve of mine. By contrast, the Game & Watch is better looking, better feeling to play, and doesn't have any awkwardness to the ergonomic design of the whole thing. This is probably my new favorite way to play Link's Awakening on on the go, as it's meant to be played. And that's saying a lot considering how many versions of the game I personally own across Nintendo's line of handhelds. The 8 hour battery life is of great assistance in this regard as well. The new 3DS XL may look a little better, but the thing lasts for such a short time without a charge that I'd barely even call it a handheld console at this point. So the question for you must remain, should you buy the Zelda Game & Watch? Definitely not, unless you fall into one of the very specific categories of people that I'm about to list. First up, if you collect Game & Watches, then you already got it, so that's a given. Second, if you have a friend or family who loves Zelda and you really can't come up with a better Christmas gift, then this will definitely fit the bill, assuming they haven't already bought it for themselves. At 50 bucks, it isn't super expensive, nor is it too cheap, so it can work as a good gift if you've got nothing better to think up. The last category is for fans of Link's Awakening. I'd say that this is the new definitive way to play the game on the go, and it's also the cheapest at the present moment, because you either need to buy a Game Boy, okay, not that bad, and then buy the game. Holy shit, are you fucking me? That's how much this thing cost- what the fuck? Or you need to buy a 3DS for anywhere between $100 and $250, then buy the game off the Nintendo store for 6 bucks. For $50, this is the cheapest way to obtain the game outside of emulation, which... Eh? Eh? That's all I'm gonna say. For literally everyone else, don't get this. There are way better and cheaper ways to play Zelda 1 and 2. As much as I hate to say it, you can just get Switch Online for 20 bucks and then BAM! You get access to both of these games and a link to the past, as well as other classics like Super Metroid and Donkey Kong Country, on a home console for a whole year. That's a way better option than playing these games on this tiny little screen. So in conclusion, only buy it if you really like the Game Boy original of Link's Awakening, or if you collect Nintendo products. Everyone else should just skip this one out. Thank you all so much for watching. Since my last upload, we hit 100. Wait, no, no, no. We hit 200. Fuck, 300. Jesus Christ, 500 subscribers. I'm honestly really surprised by just how much momentum my channel started to get, and I can't thank you all enough for getting me this far. Especially the 34 of you who stuck around for those first seven months, despite the complete lack of channel growth. It's all been really fun, and responding to the influx of comments I've been getting on my old videos has been a great pastime for me in between working on the uh, Link to the Past review, which yes, is coming out. Um, uh, somewhat soon. It's getting there. I swear it will be out before Christmas. You can hold me to that. I just thought I'd put this little product review out first as a sort of thank you to the many new usernames I've seen joining us this last month, and because of this particular Game & Watch being relevant to my first two game reviews. Anyway, thank you all so much once again for sticking with me up until this point, and have yourselves a very nice day. <laughs>